Good day, everyone. My name is Tahir Saleem, and I'm here to talk to you today about secure remote access to IEC 61850 enabled substations. Now, before we begin, just a little bit of a context on this. Uh, secure remote access relates to um, interactive remote access. Um, this is uh, more than the substation communicating with control centers. This is uh, technicians or engineers um, connecting to substation equipment or the, the software utilities, tools um, that are resident within a substation on an engineering workstation or the HMI, um, and then utilizing that to carry out their activities um, as if they were present on site. Now, there are risks associated with this, and um, the intention for this session is for me to provide you with an overview. Uh, this is a fairly extensive topic, and um, if, uh, if I'm unable to answer any of your uh, questions or address uh, your uh, areas of interest, please feel free to reach out to me on the address on screen, and uh, I'll be happy to continue this discussion with you in detail. So, what are we going to look at in this session? We're going to talk about the use cases for remote access. And so essentially what's driving the need for remote access? Uh, what is the, uh, uh, the common um, set of requirements? And uh, why the traditional remote access model used commonly within the power utilities is not adequate to address this. Um, and at the same time, we're going to look at the quantification of risks and uh, the uh, associated uh, uh, remote access um, um, services um, and engineering some mitigation controls. Before we get started, just a little bit about myself. Um, I have been involved in the cybersecurity space for close to 20 years now, and I've spent the last 12 of those years um, supporting organizations build um, security strategies and develop architectures, um, gain risk visibility, um, and uh, I've helped drive cybersecurity solution engineering, uh, play an active role in uh, commissioning of those solutions and build operations and maintenance uh, frameworks um, to uh, sustain those solutions. My most recent experience relates to um, building a security operation center for uh, a power transmission network, um, essentially having that uh, um, to gain visibility into the uh, security threats um, within uh, 400 kV and 132 kV substations. Um, and um, um, at the same time, uh, delivering uh, a benchmark um, uh, substation, a switching station actually in this case, um, that incorporates security controls um, down to bay level uh, and having that um, uh, comply with the requirements of 62443 and align with the requirements of IEC 62351. Uh, a little bit of a disclaimer there to take note of. And uh, with that, uh, we can get started. What's driving the need for remote access? I think there should be a no surprise to anyone here. Um, these are tough times. Uh, these are challenging times. Uh, it's uncharted territory uh, for uh, for um, for the globe, really. Uh, we uh, we are in it together. We have to work together. We have to stay safe and take care of ourselves and the family. So, um, with um, obviously uh, those precautionary measures, work has to still continue. And how do we make that happen? Um, by allowing access to the same assets uh, remotely. Um, and this is an interesting um, catalyst that's been created. It's actually transforming the way we think about remote access now, especially in our industry, where traditionally we've been uh, isolated um, and uh, any access remotely would typically happen from the control center itself. And these are uh, physically uh, well-protected installations. Um, and uh, even if you talk about the level of remote access from the control center, there have been limitations as to what can take place um, from a distance. And, and now we're starting to talk about uh, programming you know, our IEDs 
uh, remotely and uh, retrieving uh, fault records uh, remotely and performing analysis remotely. And, and while um, you know, being in, uh, within the uh, comfort zone of our uh, uh, homes. So um, the, the, the level of demand here is unprecedented. And, and uh, moving forward, um, it is anticipated this is going to be the new norm. Um, and we're already starting to see that in quite a few industries. Um, and, uh, and based out of a survey that was conducted uh, not too long ago, um, a, a large number of respondents actually um, stated that uh, the, um, the portion of time they spend working from home um, has actually increased significantly. And so this is a, a graphic from the research conducted by VDC. I think the report was published uh, early April uh, this year. Um, and um, no surprises here. So remote access is here to stay. Typical use cases for remote access. Now what's really driving the need for it? Um, and the number one, in my opinion, has to be asset management. Um, the ability to conduct activities um, that are typically, uh, or that were typically done uh, on site are now starting to um, happen remotely or they will happen remotely in the near future. Uh, and what this really means is uh, two things. One, from an operational perspective, um, the ability to um, manage IEDs remotely, the ability to uh, configure the settings or the device settings, the program settings um, with uh, you know, suitable version control, the ability to take data backups, the ability to restore data backups, um, you know, the ability to uh, uh, look up um, the uh, um, or retrieve the events and have those events investigated. There's quite a few things that come into play when we talk about um, the capabilities that are being demanded um, from an asset management perspective. And, and then there's the other side of the equation, which is cybersecurity. As more and more remote access is provisioned, uh, cybersecurity teams are concerned um, because now we're talking about granting access to legacy equipment and some of this equipment does not even have uh, the ability to apply security um, and then granting access to such equipment is concerning. So from a cybersecurity perspective, there is demand for greater visibility. There is a demand to understand um, what kind of hardware, what kind of firmware is running on those, what is the version number and, and all of this um, data can, is conveniently available uh, if uh, we're applying the 61850 data models itself um, and this is retrievable from the data model itself. Um, and, um, and, and then the other use case um, is the, the ability to, to access disturbance records. Now this is especially the case when we talk about uh, protection uh, teams. Um, and um, in, a, in a protection uh, uh, operational use case where we have a trip signal and then we need to retrieve that disturbance record um, from a distance and either have that automatically um, pumped into a centralized system or have that data retrieved locally and have that uh, analyzed locally or have that uh, converted to a uh, standardized format such as the IEEE Comtrade and, and have the analysis done um, uh, from a distance. And uh, then we have the substation control system alarm investigations. Um, now, traditionally uh, alarms have been grouped um, when they appear in the SCADA, the control center, and um, to have those alarms uh, understood um, to determine the root cause, the, um, uh, the um, load dispatcher or the control center operator would uh, issue a notification to the field crew. Field crew would jump on their trucks, uh, you know, arrive on site, and then uh, look up the uh, specifics of the alarms and determine the root cause and address that, uh, um, that uh, fault. Um, now, if all of that can happen remotely, you know, you, you know, the, uh, the amount of convenience, the amount of time saving, the productivity levels would just go right up the roof. And 
this is uh, definitely on the uh, most requested list. Remote maintenance. Now, remote maintenance um, is a very handy, convenient feature to have. But remote maintenance requires a greater level of remote access uh, than traditional um, remote access. Now, here we're talking about not access to a software running at a level two um, environment uh, in uh, the uh, the station LAN in this case, uh, the station level. We're talking about uh, accessing um, devices um, directly, um, and and this is obviously um, a, um, a, something that carries a lot of risk with it. So this could mean, for example, um, remote IED parameterization. Um, this could mean uh, restoring the data. This could mean uh, um, updating firmware. Um, very risky operations, essentially. Um, and um, the ability to do this remotely and to do it safely uh, is definitely a challenging task. But unfortunately, this is uh, um, a valid use case. This is the uh, one of the uh, uh, requests originating from teams today. Uh, and then we have the systems commissioning use case. Now, this is where we have point-to-point uh, -point testing with SCADA, um, where we have um, um, other test activities, interfaces set up. We have uh, um, reliability runs uh, to make sure you know, the systems are operating at the performance and the um, you know the the required level of uh, availability. And um, obviously making sure that um, the required services are visible to the concerned stakeholders. Now, this is uh, applicable um, when we have a hybrid approach um, wherein part of the team is working from remote and uh, the rest of the team is on site um, because uh, essentially during commissioning, um, on site presence is obviously a must have. Um, due to uh, a number of uh, various activities that take place. And at the same time, if we extend this further, this can apply to remote uh, factory acceptance tests. It can apply to uh, site acceptance tests as well, uh, to a degree. And last but not least is the compliance reporting. Very essential when we talk about the North American utilities that are subjected to the NERC regulations. So if you're able to provide the relevant uh, data um, remotely, uh, um, remotely retrieving it and then providing the uh, um, the compliance reports. Um, that's uh, a convenience uh, that's uh, must have. Now, take all of these use cases and apply that to the traditional model. Now, in my opinion, those use cases cannot be fulfilled if we talk about the traditional model. What is the traditional model here? Uh, typically what happens here is um, you, let me just bring up the three levels of access. In the traditional model, if I start with the, the uh, from the bottom up, the number three um, is essentially a mobile hotspot, which is turned on um, and um, uh, uh, it's it, it's uh, it's used to gain access into the uh, substation environment. Um, now, this is definitely not something which uh, is recommended, uh, and you can imagine the risks associated with doing this. But unfortunately, it happens. Uh, uh, technicians, third parties, when they want to get a remote expert on board to look at a problem. Um, or to perform certain activities such as uh, programming equipment, then this is the most convenient way to do. Unfortunately, the teams that allow this to take place are not fully aware of the risks associated with this. Um, and, 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 but unfortunately, this happens. And if you look at, at the SCADA level, we would have typically the SCADA vendor set up some kind of a VPN or dial-in service. Um, Dial-in is very rare these days anyway, um, but um, it does exist in some places. Um, and here, uh, the vendor has full access into the environment. So uh, your traditional model is essentially a flat SCADA network um, where your test systems, your reference systems, and the real-time systems are located on the same flat network. And, and the vendor typically, um, despite performing activities on the test environment or the reference system, um, does have the ability to uh, 
um, access the production environment or the real-time environment in this case. Now, the risk with that is uh, you're trusting your vendor. You're trusting that uh, they will do the right thing. You're trusting that uh, they are secure and, um, um, and, and they have adequate controls to address any security attacks at their level. Because if they are compromised and that does um, have the ability to cascade um, in your um, environment, now, the, the least, um, 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 well, not the least, but the most secure in this case, from the three, relatively speaking, is the, the um, access from the IT network. Now, in this case, IT typically is very good at doing cybersecurity, so they would have adequate controls when it comes to uh, granting legitimate um, access to authorized personnel, and they would restrict that access to a certain DMZ or business DMZ zone, uh, as illustrated in this um, diagram. And then any access that's required across to other services happens via the business DMZ. Um, now this diagram actually has a, a router here that's indicating that access is available downstream to the SCADA zone. Um, this is generally not available, but uh, if uh, access were to be made available, then it would be uh, typically via the IT network. Um, now, this is not a very good representation for security because uh, uh, here all we can see is uh, a plain vanilla router um, being used to relay access request into the SCADA zone, and we would uh, typically not want that. Um, now, take any of the use cases from the previous list I had projected and try to think about how this would be, or this, these capabilities would be enabled in this model. Uh, in my opinion, it is not doable. Not one of those use cases are practically implementable um, without introducing a significant amount of risk. Now, talking about risk, how do we actually determine our risk? How do we determine what is a best fit for us? How do we determine um, what are the security controls that um, suit us best? Um, and for that, we need to get into a risk assessment process. So um, the process I have here is overly simplified. It's from the 62443 standard. Um, and the standard requires us to, first of all, um, inventory, uh, create an inventory of all the essential processes and the related assets. So that's this box here. And once you have um, um, determined or identified all of your essential processes, you group those processes and the supporting assets um, and uh, have them categorized based on their respective security requirements. So for instance, um, your protection equipment will have a, a higher level of security requirement than the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the BMS system, for, its, for example, uh, or um, your, um, your uh, uh, substation control system, uh, considering um, the interface uh, directly, um, or they have the capability to uh, uh, perform um, critical operations. Now, once that category is of categorization is um, available, we take it through a risk assessment process. Now, this uh, uh, in this case here, it's a, it's a dash three dash two standard um, within the six two four four three portfolio of standards, um, and um, and and by applying that methodology. Uh, we would arrive at a security level target. A security level target is um, um, a terminology that's used within the standard, which essentially uh, relates to the target state of security you would like to achieve for that particular grouping of assets. So this essentially will apply to the, um, the asset categorization we did earlier at this level. Now, once the target is established, we would then apply the risk mitigation uh, approach. And uh, within the standard, um, there is uh, something called the 5D approach to risk mitigation. And I'm going to take you through that uh, in, a in a minute. 
Um, and then with that, we determine and develop the requirement specifications using the 3-3 as an input into the requirement specification. Now the requirement specification essentially is our um, set of um, um, requirements that we would like to enable within that uh, um, uh, asset uh, um, uh, area. Um, and um, this essentially can be factored in as your procurement language if you're uh, going out for tendering and um, bringing in a third party to deliver this. Um, and at the same time, um, this becomes the basis for developing your um, uh, operational and maintenance framework for that security solution that uh, you would uh, determine um, by following this process. So let, let's take an example here just to comprehend this further. Now in this example, uh, we've done our first three steps. We've uh, categorized the assets and we've determined that the system we are interested in performing a risk assessment for is the protection IEDs itself. Um, you know, this may be um, any, any protection area, uh, whether it's a bus bar um, or anything else. For that matter, we're just grouping them all into one group and uh, the specific process of interest is the retrieval of disturbance records uh, remotely. So this is what uh, we intend to do here. Now, um, the threat we have identified is unauthorized access to the protection IEDs or the station LAN itself. Um, and uh, you can imagine what that would happen, uh, what would happen if that were to be realized. So in this case, we've identified the consequences tampering protection settings that could impact network stability in the event of a fault. So um, you could uh, relate this to uh, things like um, um, modifying the settings to, uh, to perform an instantaneous trip, uh, for example, um, or you could look at um, a situation where the, um, you have a, um, a, 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 well, perhaps um, an unreliable check zone scheme uh, in the event of uh, the protection zones itself uh, being uh, tampered with, uh, and then um, that could uh, trigger um, stability issues if a fault were to occur. Now the severity of that is rated as a high, uh, with the 20 being the numerical value for the high rating. Now this factors in um, a 655 risk matrix for those of you who are um, uh, risk practitioners. Um, risk management practitioners. And um, the process hazard analysis um, determines that this is going to uh, lead to a consequence um, that would equate to lost time injury. Um, so you could have um, um, maintenance engineers that uh, um, could uh, potentially get injured in the process if this were to happen in the field. And the substation would go offline um, and uh, potentially result in damage to primary equipment. And the severity associated with that is extreme. So that's the highest level of severity um, we can uh, factor in. Now, what are the current controls associated with this? Um, we have physical isolation, we have locked cabinets, um, we have um, the, okay, a reliable protection check zone scheme in place here. Um, and the risk rating overall for this particular risk is extreme. Um, and uh, the way we determined that is we simply took the highest uh, severity rating when considering system impact and the process hazard uh, analysis. So it's an extreme risk rating. So let's take that forward now. So taking that forward, we will determine the security level target. Now a security level target is what we're aspiring to achieve. And in this case, we will use um, a, an, another um, metric here, which is the CRRF. What is CRRF? Um, it is essentially um, a degree, is a measure of the degree of the required risk reduction um, to reduce the risk to a tolerable level. Um, and um, it's a risk reduction factor essentially. And 
in the way we calculate that is we identify the unmitigated risk. So if you look at the previous example, the unmitigated risk was extreme of 24, and we divide that by the tolerable risk of that organization. In this instance, the tolerable risk of this organization is equal to or less than four. So anything below that essentially uh, is tolerable. In this case, we're taking number four. Uh, and if we do the math here, um, our corresponding security level target is three. Now, three is what we are aspiring here for, but if we go beyond that, obviously um, it's not a problem as long as uh, uh, the value analysis uh, done from the cost uh, and uh, relating maintenance procedures is um, acceptable. So we have the security level target and the next thing we need to do is um, apply the 5D risk mitigation. So what are the 5Ds? Is essentially deter, detect, delay, deny, and defeat. Now, if you're taking the same risk into consideration, and if we were to deter an adversary from gaining unauthorized access by means of uh, channeling through the remote access service, we would have a policy in place, we would have security awareness and culture, um, awareness in place, and we would have um, notices uh, during remote logon. Um, now, as we all know, that, okay, is good to a degree um, to deter. However, how do we detect that uh, particular threat? We detect by means of a network or a host intrusion detection system. Um, and uh, if you were to apply the delay um, um, control, and that would require us to remove the default password on IEDs and related software tools. This is a common problem in the industry. Um, it's no longer prevalent in newer IEDs. Um, unfortunately, in the, um, the older models, we still have this. Um, and then we would have a honeypot as another means to delay this. And essentially a honeypot is a, a, a mimic of the real system. Um, with the intention to capture a behavior of an adversary um, in order for us to study the behavior and determine the motive um, for the intrusion. Um, deny, um, the deny control requires us to prevent direct access to IEDs and utilize instead uh, automated fault record collection system. So what we are really saying here is let's put a, a DFR in place and let's not allow the uh, uh, engineers to directly interface with the equipment uh, when they're accessing the system remotely. Um, and the other control is network segregation and having controlled access points. So network segregation essentially, um, well, we're, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but the, the, uh, let's focus on a couple of controls here. So let's take network segregation as one control that we're going to um, develop further as part of the uh, continuation of this uh, example. And we'll also look at the removal of default passwords. So, so we're going to touch upon delay and deny in our requirement specifications next. Um, but just to, before we proceed, um, the defeat um, uh, requires us to um, monitor the remote sessions. So we have visibility as to what's going on and then um, stop uh, the intruder in, before any impact can be realized, negative impact. And uh, we have an active uh, vulnerability management system in place. So we are aware of what are the vulnerabilities within the environment that we are uh, granting this remote access for, and then we deal with that uh, accordingly. So um, just to very briefly look into those two controls I mentioned earlier, network segmentation and segregation for remote or local access, and then authentication credential management. Now in this, uh, I'm, I just want to point out um, a few things here and you, you'll be getting access to these slides so you can uh, you know, look this up in more detail. But, but when, we, when we specify the controls here, um, we look at uh, uh, something from the objective of stopping the attacker in their tracks. Now for the network segregation um, was applicable if you remember um, the, in, the, in the deny category. So we're looking at deny and delay. 
So in the deny category, network segregation plays a role by requiring us to place DPI enabled firewalls, so deep packet inspection enabled firewalls. So that will grant us the visibility uh, into the protocol, the OT protocol in use, the ability to decode those protocol, um, to examine what exactly is being sent and whether the, uh, the messages, the values, the functions, the, the thresholds match the operational requirements. So anything beyond that is restricted. And, and that's an SLT4 uh, control. Uh, remember, we wanted an SLT3. Uh, however, in this example, we determined that we can actually employ an SLT4 because uh, um, the cost of putting in a DPI-enabled firewall versus a traditional um, 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 uh, for traditional fire, uh, stateful packet inspection or stateful inspection firewall is negligible. Um, so we I decided to go with an SLT4 instead, which is um, yeah, providing us greater visibility. Uh, and the other thing in here is uh, when we are doing remote access, um, this particular uh, control requires us to terminate the remote session in level 2.5. Essentially, we're introducing a station DMZ in this case. Uh, and um, that uh, termination in station DMZ shall only happen after successful two-factor authentication. Now, if that is not available, then we, or if it is available and we would like to go one level further, we could have a digital relay contact um, available and that's controlled by the uh, the control center itself, uh, and that's available within SCADA system itself. So there's uh, additional control that's available if we wanted to allow that. Um, and if there is um, uh, any uh, issue that's raised, uh, for example, a failed attempt to log on, um, then SCADA alarms can be triggered and uh, that can take place via the common um, IED in the substation. Now that's one, and then the other part is um, relating to um, the authentication credential management. If you recall, we mentioned that uh, there shall be no default passwords. Um, and in this case, we're asking the suppliers to certify that no hard-coded or undocumented credentials exist. Now this uh, essentially, this text uh, would go into your specifications um, and that's how we uh, utilize this. Um, the advantage of this approach is uh, we now have um, um, a clear, consistent, traceable uh, approach as to why we're asking for these controls. It goes back to um, the requirement and then that requirement is subjected to a structured risk assessment and, and then that results in the underlying security controls. Um, and, and, you know, the, this kind of text obviously is something that was uh, customized uh, um, for a customer. Uh, however, if you'd like to look up uh, some of the inputs and the IC62443-3-3 is a good place to start uh, to build something similar. Now, um, where do we go for, for further guidance? Now, in this session, I did not want to go through um, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the typical uh, technology-oriented solutions um, to um, have a strong remote access solution. For example, um, looking at the crypto systems that you could use, looking at uh, um, you know, the, the monitoring approaches. I wanted you to go through a, a, a structured risk assessed approach that will allow you to determine what is the best fit for you. Um, and if you'd like to look up uh, some of the guidance around this, there's definitely external guidance available. This, there are standards that are applicable in this space as well. And there are technologies um, that you can look at uh, to enable your um, requirements. Uh, technology, bear in mind, is not uh, the only solution here. So you cannot work with technology by itself. Um, it has to be supported by um, defined processes and um, uh, run by trained staff. Now, bear in mind, technology 
will have vulnerabilities, security vulnerabilities. Um, there have been some recent instances of that being revealed, and uh, this is something we need to watch out for. Now, with that, um, um, I end my presentation here, and I would like to thank the organizers for having me, and uh, I trust uh, this has been uh, um, um, helpful for you to gain an understanding on the approach, how to um, build a secure remote access solution. And like I mentioned earlier, if you'd like to get in touch, please, please feel free to connect. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video insightful and enjoyable. We post new Smart Grid related videos every Friday at 12 CET. So please go ahead and subscribe and let colleagues in other departments and peers in other organizations know so that they can benefit too. We welcome your feedback. So if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to post them below. Thanks again and have a great day.